Um, my name is Thomas Godwin. My pronouns are they and them. And I work with SAGE, which is a national advocacy and services organization for LGBTQ plus older adults. I will be your event MC today, and I'm very excited for us to get started. If you are going to need closed captioning for our event today, um, the closed captions for this Zoom call have been enabled. You can clip, click the closed captions button on the bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen. If you're having any technical difficulties or issues today, please try logging out of the Zoom call and then logging back into the event. And if you're still having technical difficulties after that, feel free to type into the chat what's going on and we will try to get you the support that you need. As a participant in this event, you will likely have the best viewing experience using the speaker view on Zoom. This will allow you to focus in on who is speaking today or the different speakers and panelists as they're giving us a wonderful expertise and information they have to offer us today. If you'd like to access this speaker view, click on the view button on the top right corner of your Zoom screen and select the speaker view from the drop-down menu. Additionally, please note that this conversation will be recorded um, and the recording of this event will be posted on our SAGE YouTube as well as our SAGE website and can be shared with colleagues or friends in the future. So I'm gonna quickly go over our agenda for this morning. Today, we will begin by hearing from a few speakers. Our first speaker will remind us of the importance of inclusive mental health services for LGBTQ plus people and how that relates to our conversation today. Our second speaker will highlight some of SAGE's work across the country for LGBTQ plus older adults and will introduce the National Housing Initiative at SAGE. Our then, our then our keynote speaker will address um, the need for LGBTQ plus inclusive housing services, specifically in Nashville, providing an overview of the need for inclusive spaces for LGBTQ plus people in Middle Tennessee. After our speakers, we will hear from a panel of community and professional leaders in housing and community development to discuss the potential for LGBTQ plus affirming older adult housing here in Nashville. After our panel, we'll take a short six minute break for us to go to the restroom, grab some water, whatever we need. And then after our break, we will spend some time in breakout sessions, diving deeper into what it's going to take to build affordable and inclusive housing in Nashville. So before we dive into this packed agenda, I wanna take a moment to thank our event partners for this event. From the start of our planning for this event, these partners have provided integral feedback and support at every step along the process. So Inclusion Tennessee and Urban Housing Solutions, thank you for being dedicated partners in the planning of this event. It could not have happened without you. I also want to thank our event planning partners, Tuttle Co., for providing integral technical support and project management on this event as well. And lastly, this event was made possible by the generous support of the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation. And we at SAGE are always grateful for their consistent commitment to supporting LGBTQ plus equality for older adults. So now we can get started with our lovely program for today. And we are going to begin by having our first speaker center this conversation and reminding us of the importance of mental health inclusive services for LGBTQ plus um, people and older adults. So Ashley Hampton, who uses she, her pronouns, is the executive director of Healing in the Margins. Ashley is dedicated to creating, holding, and amplifying space for folks in marginalized communities, dedicated to overseeing fundraising efforts, and dedicated to intensive community engagement. Ashley is also the co-founder and clinical director of Hampton House Counseling, a group counseling practice dedicated to serving individuals from marginalized communities. She is a certified clinical supervisor with a passion for training new clinicians in the BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities. Ashley, thank you so much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk about the incredible need for inclusive mental health care. Um, something that I spend all day doing, so I'm super excited getting to share that. Um, 
I think that something that I see all the time here in Nashville is, you know, as, as a QPOC person, I often have worked with people who experience, you know, different types of trauma or religious abuse, different things like that. But as of lately um, in Tennessee specifically and other states, there's been so much um, anti-LGBT legislation. And so we've been hearing about that more and more um, with the clients that we work with. And so um, I often think it's so important for people to have a therapist or to have mental health resources or to have their basic needs met in an inclusive environment because um, no one should have to sacrifice their identity for the things that they need or, you know, if our basic needs aren't met, how do we do that really hard work of taking care of ourselves and then being able to give back to our community. So I think that safe, competent, representative care is so important for um, healing for, for all people. That's all I got, I think, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. I appreciate you just bringing that into this conversation reminding us um, that there is a lot of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation happening in Tennessee, and that's affecting um, especially our LGBTQ plus folks in Tennessee and also across the country. And so we're very appreciative of the work that you are doing at Healing in the Margins. Um, and I just want to encourage folks, um, if you'd like to support the work that Ashley's doing, um, please, please donate to Healing in the Margins. Um, or get involved in any capacity, we will have a donate link on the video that you'll see playing through the break of this event. Um, so please, please donate. Um, the work that they're doing is very, very important to supporting um, the mental health and well-being of LGBTQ plus people in Nashville. Yep. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. So um, our next speaker is going to offer a brief overview of SAGE's national work and the work of the National LGBTQ Plus Elder Housing Initiative, otherwise known as the NHI. Sydney Cop Richardson, who uses she, her pronouns, is the director of the National LGBTQ Plus Elder Housing Initiative at SAGE. Before working at SAGE, Sydney worked in Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City in direct services, organizing and advocacy, and policy analysis around housing and houselessness, HIV, and health access. She enjoys Chicago pizza and long walks with her partner and baby Merle. Sydney, we're so excited for you to be here today and share with us a little bit about SAGE and the NHI. Hi, Thomas. Thank you so much. Thanks for that intro. And thank you again, Ashley, for grounding us um, in that critically important centering of mental health, intersectional mental, mental health care um, that is more timely than ever, really. Um, so first, um, I'd like to discuss a little bit about our work at the NHI. For folks that aren't familiar, SAGE is the world's largest an oldest, oldest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ plus older people or elders. And we aim to foster an understanding of aging in all communities and promote positive images of LGBTQ plus elders in later years. We offer a variety of programs and services for elders in New York City and nationwide. And I'll discuss a little bit about what that entails. Um, so SAGE advocates for Queer aging policies at the local, the state, the federal levels to address challenges our communities face as we age. We offer home and community-based services and consumer education through our care management program and our local SAGE centers across the five boroughs in New York City, where community members come on site for programming, for healthcare support, for social connection, and for food access. We've seen compounded isolation, especially recently, um, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and this is really critical for people's health and wellness and resilience. We host the credentialed SAGE Care Cultural Competency Training Program as part of our new SAGE Venture Branch and national partnerships and coalitions through our SAGE Collab Program. We also host the National Resource Center on LGBTQ plus aging, which is a repository of research of resources and tools on LGBTQ plus aging. And in partnership with HRC, we've developed the Long-Term long Care Equality Index, also known as the LEI, helping elder housing communities to adopt policies and best practices to provide culturally competent and responsive care to LGBTQ plus older people. Uh, we also provide international education and advocacy. 
The next topic I'd like to discuss is the NHI. So um, we know that affordability and safety is a challenge for our communities as we age. And since 2015, the National Housing Initiative or the NHI has provided uh, technical assistance and public education around the development of safe, affirming affordable housing nationally, serving as a model for best practices and a resource for region-specific advocates, service providers, developers, community members. We work a lot with folks that even as individuals come to us and say, we want to develop affirming housing for um, people in our communities as we age, how can we do that? So the five key strategies of the NHI include building housing, changing policy, educating consumers, expanding services and training providers, community orgs and housing developers nationwide on these needs. And LGBTQ plus affirming elder housing is a growing model, um, serving a swiftly growing market as we, as we see the, the boomer generation and um, those of, many of us starting to age. Um, LGBTQ plus affirming simply means housing that provides a welcoming environment of community, of peers, of allies, um, often involving culturally competent, culturally relevant services with affordability taken into account, um, as well as intersectionality um, and the needs of uh, folks living, as we, as we may say, in the margins and, and experiencing deep vulnerability based on race, based on gender identity, based on, um, income, et cetera. So next, I'd like to share just a few of the resources that the NHI can provide you. These are some of the free resources that we've developed. We have a primer um, titled Understanding the Affordable Housing Development Process, which documents the five stages of affordable housing, includes key considerations, as well as in-depth case studies of this model of housing across the country and folks' journeys in getting there. We have a housing developer toolkit with different modules on a range of topics from community engagement to building buy-in to trauma-informed design, marketing, cultural competency, LIHTC. We have new free trainings for developers, for community orgs, um, and property management outlining some of these key factors in developing and running this type of housing. And we also provide technical assistance to stakeholders across the country looking for support and provide connections to things like financing experts like the um, National Equity Fund as a syndicator, for example. We host symposia, regional roundtables such as this one, and we help people strategize and plan. So you can find all of this information and more research and resources, such as Sage's own case study of our own housing development process, which was a journey um, on a portal that we've developed at our website. Um, and we can share that in the link too. So next, I'm gonna turn it back to Thomas to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney, for offering that comprehensive overview of the work we are doing at SAGE and with the National LGBTQ Plus Elder Housing Initiative. And if any of you would like to get involved, um, please feel free to check us out on our website. Um, and I'll also be posting my email in the chat at the end of the event today. So feel free to connect with us if you would like more resources or technical support around building inclusive elder housing. Um, but we're now going to transition to discussing the specific needs of LGBTQ plus older adults and people in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. Um, we also want to discuss some of the work that's being done already across the state and across the city to support this community. And so I'm excited to introduce you all to our keynote speaker, Phil Kabuchi, who uses he and they pronouns. Phil is an award-winning marketing and branding expert with over 15 years of experience. Originally hailing from the New York City region, Phil began their career in the music industry working for Warner Bros. Records. In 2009, he started his own marketing and branding agency, BAM, in Nashville, Tennessee. BAM grew by more than 130% in over a year, and Phil was able to build relationships with over 100 international clients. In 2021, Phil led the founding of Inclusion Tennessee, a new organization that is focused on embracing opportunities of collective impact for LGBTQ plus people, creating programs that are focused on the health and wellness of LGBTQ plus people, and building a space that allows LGBTQ plus people to gather, learn, live, celebrate, and uplift one another in a supportive and safe environment. In 2023, Phil transitioned from board president of Inclusion Tennessee to its first full-time executive director. 
Over the past five years, Phil has also had the pleasure of serving within the leadership of many community associations and boards. They were the president of Nashville Pride in 2017 to 2018, and he has been featured in many major newspapers, magazines, publications, and television shows. They have spoken at a number of conferences and events in various industries, and in 2023, Phil is starting his Master's of Public Service at the University of Arkansas Little Rock, so congratulations, Phil. In Phil's free time, Phil enjoys reading, cooking, and traveling, and they live with their partner, Stuart, in the historic Buena Vista neighborhood with their dogs, Billie Jean King and Weezer Bordeaux. Phil, thank you so much for being with us today, and I'm just so excited for everyone to get to hear from you on these really important issues. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Thomas. I appreciate it. Glad to be with all of you today. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled for this conversation because I think it's so critically important to our work uh, collectively throughout the entire state, because I believe that when we're thinking about LGBTQ older adults across the state of Tennessee and really across the South, one of the things that we we really um, are not, we don't think about uh, collectively is that uh, when we are looking at the, the need of LGBTQ older adults throughout our communities, and throughout the South, we don't understand the depths of social isolation, discrimination, and then the legacies of harm that fa face our communities. Um, and when we are looking at those things from a national perspective, we see these, um, these this information that's collected here uh, from our friends at SAGE. Um, when we look at it from a national perspective, we see that social, is social isolation, um, LGBTQ older adults, are more likely to have distance from their biological family. Um, they face heightened risks of social isolation given decades of discrimination. 40% of LGBTQ older adults note that their community is growing smaller. smaller. There are more than 2.7 million uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans and queer uh, older adults who are 50 plus living in communities across the country. And that number continues to become smaller. Um, LGBT older adults are also twice as likely to live alone um, compared to their non compared to non LGBTQ uh, adults and their counterparts, and often face social isolation and increased vulnerabilities. When we look at discrimination, 25% of trans individuals and 48% of same sex couples have experienced housing discrimination due to their identity. And while some LGBTQ older adults may continue to experience discrimination because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, they may also experience other types of discrimination, such as ageism, sexism, racism, or HIV and AIDS status. These factors would essentially contribute to the risk of other social isolations and even more invisibility when we think of LGBTQ older adults, especially within the health and social services sectors, and they have direct impact on the overall health of this community. And then when we think about the legacies of harm that are conti continue to be perpetrated on this community, LGBTQ older adults have lived through decades of harm that have resulted in increased financial disparities and increased housing disparities for this community. And while there has been immense progress for this community over the last 50 years for LGBTQ people in general, we have to note that there, first and foremost, that there has been persistent attempts to restrict and diminish our communities from existence in more than half of the states in the United States in just the past, past few legislative sessions in states, uh, mostly in the South, but in the middle part of America. Um, and then beyond that, members of our older adult population have also lived through immense challenges towards their very existence for decades. So what we are experiencing today in some of these states, just like Tennessee and throughout the South and in some of the more middle parts of America, are not uncommon to many folks who live in our, who, are, who, who identify as part of an older, older adult community. They have lived through these immense challenges and know what we are experiencing today. This harm and pain does not go away and it is carried on for generations and generations. On top of that, we also must remember that we have lost hundreds of thousands of people to HIV and AIDS, to the HIV and AIDS crisis in the 1980s and the 1990s. 
Uh, this is an entire generation of folks, mostly men, who had so much to offer our world. Uh, these are friends and partners and family members, sons, brothers, coworkers. And this is a trauma that is a trauma of loss uh, that has been carried with many members of our community for so many years. Um, and it's a, it's a generation that has just been lost. And I think that we don't often think about that. We have obviously some historical record of lives that have been lost and, and, and um, communities that have been left behind. But the sad reality is, is that we don't think about the history that, um, is, car that is carried on with losing 500,000, 600,000, 700,000 wonderful men um, and wonderful community members who have offered, who had so much to offer our world. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a heartbreaking fact that we have to live with and we, talk, we have to talk through. Um, and that's a, that's a period, that's a trauma of, that's a trauma of loss that is still carried today to so many members of this community and something that we have to continue to honor and think about. Now, from a local perspective, um, we have to think about how this also impacts our communities from a from, from a low, from a, on a local side. Older adults in our community are, don't have access to a lot of services, especially those who uh, are looking for access to LGBTQ plus services uh, within their area. So 85% of LGBTQ older adults do not have access to services within their area, according to our research that was completed in 2019. So maybe to take a step back, when we completed this survey, we completed a, a community needs assessment um, that was commissioned by National Pride in 2019. We went into this survey not really knowing what we were going to hear. We knew that the community wanted more than what was presently available. And our survey took nine months to complete. It became the foundation of all of the programs that we have now at Inclusion Tennessee and what we are looking to build in the future. But one thing I can tell you is that when we went into this survey process in 2019, we didn't really understand or know at that point that what we were going to hear was going to inform the development of a brand new organization that was going to be focused on creating uh, essentially a, 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 a nucleus, if you will, um, of that would spearhead a lot of different initiatives in our community um, and bring together other organizations that served our community um, already to realize that there are so many other needs that exist and, and identify those needs. So our survey took nine months to complete. It became the foundation of, of what we're doing at Inclusion Tennessee. And what we ended up doing was talk to almost 2,500 people. And in that research, we found that older adults um, are concerned about having adequate social supports as they age. Um, they were uh, concerned that uh, there is really no affirming older adult services in the state. Um, they were concerned uh, that there was not a safe space for them to just be and exist. There was not social opportunities for them to gather collectively uh, outside of a bar. Um, there was extreme social isolation um, and so much. Uh, we also know that these uh, resources are many of the resources that exist in our communities today, including continuing care and retirement communities, are religiously affiliated, which doesn't always mean that these spaces are safe for LGBTQ adults. So putting a lot of folks back into the closet at, in an older age, especially in the South, which is unacceptable. Um, when we look at older adult programming, we know that there's not enough programming. Uh, with our friends at 50 Forward and our friends at SAGE, we are going to change that. Um, we are also committed to creating programs and engaging in conversations like this one and exploring what we can do to create more enhanced social supports so that as our LGBTQ older adults age, 
there is support mechanisms and programs and support services for our communities so that they can find support and programmings and um, and uh, resources so that they can thrive at, in their older age. And then finally, as part of it, in, in their resource need, the Community Visioning Project reports that shows that there's extensive need for services throughout Middle Tennessee. And while this report was completed in 2019, and so much changed in just a three, a short three year span, we completed an updated version of this study in 2022 that was focused solely on space needs of programming a physical center and where we should invest efforts in programming. Not surprisingly, um, that effort showed that there was real deep need in these specific areas and programming for older adults, programming for youth and young people, were very much at the top of the list. The need for safe space was also very much at the top of the list. The importance of safe space covers these three areas, belonging, safety, and healing. I wanna call attention to this quote on the bottom is that we need a community space for LGBTQIA members of all ages to meet and develop friendships outside of a bar. It is so important to increase the casual sociability of the queer residents of Middle Tennessee. We need programs and activities to educate and a place around me where I can meet other LGBT people my age. It goes back to what I was saying earlier is that we don't have spaces that are safe for LGBT older adults so that they can feel safe and feel comfortable in spaces outside of nightlife establishments. So a little bit on LGBTQ community centers. Our desire to build and create an LGBTQ community center here in Nashville will serve the Middle Tennessee population with satellite services throughout the region. We have continued research and strategic, we've had continued research and strategic conversations since our most recent 2022 survey with the Civic Design Center and hope to be able to move forward with the creation of a safe space soon. There are over 200 LGBTQ plus community centers around the country and many more around the world. Since, um, since then, uh, Nashville is the only city in the is Nashville is the only city in the top 20 largest cities in the country that does not have uh, an LGBTQ plus community center. And we believe that that needs to change and we are on a quest to change that. And then finally, LGBTQ plus inclusive and affordable housing. There is no denying that affordable housing is needed throughout Middle Tennessee. And even more so, we believe that our research has informed that affordable housing for LGBTQ older adults and young people is desperately needed throughout this region. This is critical for the continued growth of our city and ensuring our region is a welcoming and safe space for all. There are many other examples of affordable and inclusive housing all over this country, and they are found in many cities, including Houston, Fort Lauderdale, Philadelphia, and more. And so that is what we're gonna talk about today as a group. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Phil, for um, providing us with that really broad stroke painting of kind of where things are not only nationally, but also here in um, Nashville and Middle Tennessee. I think the efforts that you all are pushing through Inclusion Tennessee and your work with the Civic Design Center and Urban Housing Solutions are going to make a really big difference for the health and well-being and access to support and services for LGBTQ plus older adults in the state. Um, we do have a few minutes here for some Q&A from the audience for Phil. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the live chat. Um, also feel free to come off mute, um, but we will be moderating the, moderating the chat um, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So I'll open the floor up for questions for Phil now.
Hey, Phil, I just got a question in the, as a direct message. Um, but I, this question is more generally about Tennessee and where things are at in terms of the state. But what are some ways that folks who are not directly involved with LGBTQ plus advocacy can support LGBTQ plus people amidst the growing anti um, LGBTQ plus legislation? So how can folks continue to support the community with everything that's kind of going on in the state right now? It's a great question, Thomas. I think there's a lot of a lot of really unique opportunities to get involved. There are some really amazing organizations that are working on the Hill consistently uh, to combat anti-LGBTQ legislation. Um, so Tennessee Equality Project has been leading this effort for many, many years uh, on the Hill, and we have um, been a proud partner of them for the last two years. Um, Chris Sanders has been an incredible leader in that work. Uh, but then there's also other organizations that have been have kind of stepped alongside and have kind of helped support that effort, right? And so I think Tennessee Equality Project helps lead that work. And so supporting Tennessee Equality Project to first and foremost, and then following alongside of us and following alongside of Inclusion Tennessee and, and Human Rights Campaign and some of the other larger national organizations that follow the lead of uh, Tennessee Equality Project are a great first step. Wonderful. Thank you, Phil. I see Nancy um, has just put in the chat the website for the Tennessee Equality Project. So thank you for adding that in the chat, Nancy. Um, any other questions for Phil? We've got about three more minutes for questions. I think we've got time for one more. Um, okay, I'm seeing a question in the chat here, Phil. I'm just going to read it out loud. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship that you have with 50 Forward? I'm participating with that group and find them a wonderful support, but it has been hard to spread the word about the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I don't think that people in the community want to consider themselves quote unquote senior citizens and are hesitant to participate. Uh, thank you, Renee. I appreciate the question. I think it, it's important that we also say older adults, right? That's why one of the things that I've, I've been really mindful about, about saying, and even then I, I am very hesitant about even saying older adults sometimes. Um, but I, our relationship with 50 Forward is continuing to, continuing to grow and evolve. Um, 50 Forward started, uh, our, par our partnership with 50 Forward started fo immediately following the uh, community visioning project back in 2020, right, right before the start of the pandemic. Um, and 50 Forward was one of the first organizations to really take a lead on understanding that there was a need for uh, really deep programming, a really thoughtful programming for LGBTQ older adults. Um, and, and Sally is here on the call. Um, and, and I will tell you, Sally, uh, was one of the first deep believers in um, in understanding the need for this at 50 Forward, and, I, and I'm so grateful to uh, to her energy behind this, um, and uh, to Gretchen, who who is also at 50 Forward, to help who has helped lead this. I will say that you know with 50 Forward, the um, they have led they have led a an, uh, an effort behind. Um, Sort of a working group to develop um, the the older adult the older adult efforts for LGBT uh, initiatives, um, and over I would say the last four months or so, some of those efforts have actually picked up steam. And so I would say in the next fifteen to twenty one days, hopefully. Renee, we will actually have some exciting announcements to share about a deeper partnership uh, between 50 Forward and Inclusion Tennessee. Um, first of which I can actually tell you now will be, um, we are actually partnering together to create a Disco Pride event um, for older adults. Uh, and so I'm so excited about that. And um, that will actually be on the 23rd of June. Uh, and so um, an opportunity to come together and celebrate um, where you're out of the sun and out of the heat, but we'll have a good time. Um, we'll do a little bit of drag bingo. We'll have a good time of fun and fellowship. Um, and 
I have a couple other fun things up our sleeve that I can't tell you about just yet, but. Thank you, Phil, um, and thank you, Renee, for that question. Like Phil said, we will be um, hearing from Sally Hussey of 50 Forward um, on our panel just in a moment, so we'll get to hear a little bit more from her soon. Um, but thank you again, Phil, for your time um, and energy in this work. We very, very much appreciate you um, and just your willingness to come talk with us today. And we'll get to hear from Phil later at the end of the event as well. Um, so now we are going to move into our community panel. Um, this next section of the roundtable will focus on exploring how LGBTQ plus inclusive housing could happen in Nashville. Um, we'll be talking to a group of experts in housing and community development, design and services. And these panelists will help us to sort of imagine together what LGBTQ plus inclusive housing could look like for this city. So um, we're gonna start with our first panelist. There is her wonderful headshot. But our first panelist is council member Nancy Van Rees, who uses she, her pronouns. Council member Nancy Van Rees is a distinguished leader in the Nashville community. In her time as a council member, Van Rees has successfully advocated for increased affordable housing units, increased use of renewable energy services, and a refurbished Nashville infrastructure. She has also acted as a leader in cultural competency and diversity conversations at a district level. By serving as the first chair of the LGBTQ plus caucus of the Nashville Metropolitan Council and by spearheading the COVID-19 response for Nashvillians 65 plus task force. Nancy is also the vice president for strategic engagement for the LDG development group in Nashville, Tennessee. Before her role as a council member, Nancy contributed to the Nashville community and infrastructure through various jobs and volunteer opportunities, specifically investing in the Nashville music industry for a large portion of her career. In all her work, Nancy aims to balance successful growth for businesses, housing services, nonprofit organizations, community members, and the arts. Nancy is an experienced public speaker and a proud advocate of the LGBTQ plus community in Tennessee. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. We're so excited to hear from you today. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's it's always uh, interesting. The older I get, how long the bio goes. So that I appreciate the, the truncation. Uh, it has been my pleasure to uh, turn into a Nashvilleian since 1986. I uh, I met my wife, uh, Joan, in 1988 at a women's Bible study. It's one of the um, best stories uh, when campaigning is for people to, to ask you what your husband does. It says, uh, you know, I, I met my wife at a Bible study. It completely throws people off. Um, but it is uh, it is my pleasure uh, to become a Nashville. And I actually grew up uh, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. I went to school in Texas before moving here in the mid 80s. And uh, my wife and I uh, married uh, legally on our 26th anniversary in Washington, D.C. Uh, even that decision was made um, because we were unclear about Tennessee's ability to provide uh, equitable opportunities for us. And so we, we uh, decided to marry in the District of Columbia uh, so that no state would have power over our union. And um, and that was a, one of many conscious decisions that we, we've had to make um, as a couple um, on our 10th anniversary. We went through that entire process with uh, uh, the legendary Abby Rubenfeld to go through uh, powers of attorney and healthcare power of attorney and to get things set up. Um, we, because of several different uh, reasons. Uh, we were not out to our family, even as a couple, for the first decade of our relationship. And so um, being a part of a community uh, and uh, being able to be our complete and total selves uh, here in Nashville has been quite a journey uh, for us. Uh, I am, as as mentioned, uh, the uh, Vice President of Strategic Engagement for 
a company called LDG Development. They're actually out of Louisville, Kentucky, and we have a Nashville office here. And, and the Nashville office focuses on Tennessee, and Louisiana, and Alabama. And uh, we are in uh, five other states as well as a company um, with over uh, 22,000 homes for individuals and in workforce and affordable housing. Um, about 110 different properties. Uh, three of those properties are up in uh, Madison, Tennessee, uh, where I am. I got to know the company. Uh, one is off of Trinity. We have about a thousand uh, units here in Nashville and uh, another 200 coming up out of the ground in uh, Chattanooga. I was brought in to kind of uh, work on placemaking and placekeeping at our developments and uh, doing so by engaging local artists and uh, being able to uh, make sure that we are uh, putting uh, the, the budgets uh, for uh, the artwork in our clubhouses into the hands and pockets of local artists whenever possible. And then also making sure that we're engaging uh, not just in place making, but as I said, also place keeping so that uh, we are uh, acknowledging the places that we're going into. Uh, we are right now working very diligently on providing uh, 50 new senior units uh, right next uh, door to uh, one of a uh, 50 forward location. And so um, as that uh, opportunity uh, becomes a reality, then I'm going to be hyperly engaged in making sure that it is a, an inclusive location. I turn 60 next year. And so uh, I, I'm kind of in that that weird middle uh, where people say 50 over and I'm like going, I'm not a senior. It's kind of like, oh, am I a senior? It's like, well, I, I am a member of AARP and I support SAGE, so I'm getting there, right? But I think that uh, my perspective on this, both as a, as a transplant Nashvilleian, uh, kind of coming out of a faith-based background that uh, prohibited us being out at first and going through that journey, I would love to be able to find places where I can have those conversations with people in an authentic way um, as I leave office here at the end of the summer. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, with you guys today and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Nancy. We're really happy that you are here with us as well. And we know you've made such an amazing impact on the Nashville community. So thank you again. Um, and I'm now gonna introduce our next panelist, um, Brent Elrod, who uses he, him pronouns. Brent is the Managing Director of Urban Housing Solutions, Nashville's largest nonprofit housing and community developer. Brent assumed the role of the Principal Executive Officer of Urban Housing Solutions in 2020, overseeing the Directors of Finance, Asset Management, Facilities, Design and Development, and Resident Services. Since joining Urban Housing Solutions in 2006, Brent has managed or overseen the acquisition, pre-development, design, and construction for Urban Housing Solutions through 26 separate projects, which added up to over 1,000 apartments to a combined cost of more than $110 million. Brent is a member of the Urban Land Institute Nashville and the Nashville Civic Design Center. He holds a master's in public policy from the University of Maryland and a bachelor's of arts in philosophy from the George Washington University. Brent, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and similar to Nancy, if you just wanna share a little bit about your context to this conversation, um, and um, kind of your position to housing work for folks in Nashville, that would be really great. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Thomas. And good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, one thing I guess I, I didn't put in the bio is that I'm also a Nashville native. So uh, I've, I've seen Nashville uh, through the awkward 90s uh, into the, uh, you know, the challenging 2020s. And, um, you know, definitely uh, for, for that reason, uh, and a lot of other reasons, really, um, committed to the mission. So Urban Housing Solutions, as Thomas said, is, is a nonprofit affordable housing developer, community developer uh, here in Nashville. We own and manage about 1,000 apartments in Nashville. We've developed about 1,600 apartments um, you know, over the last 32 years. We were founded in 1991. Uh, our mission is to provide affordable homes in supportive communities. And so that, for us, um, is really the essential combination. Uh, it's not just providing an affordable home, which uh, is certainly needed in Nashville and everywhere, but also really a rich, vibrant 
uh, authentic community where people really feel like they can, um, you know, be who they be who they really are and feel like they belong in this in our community in Nashville specifically. So um, we've since 1991 really focused on trying to address unmet housing needs in Nashville. Initially, that included or that really focused on uh, people who are overcoming homelessness. Uh, and over the years, we have um, basically, with the help of community partners who have helped us to understand the needs better in our community, tried to bring our housing development and um, property management uh, and resident services uh, teams together to help support and provide additional specific supportive communities for folks to address those unmet housing needs. Uh, that includes people with disabilities, people with a diagnosed mental illness, people in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction, victims of domestic violence, uh, people living with HIV and AIDS, um, veterans, older adults, uh, and just in general, people with very low incomes. Over 85% of our residents uh, earn about $26,000 a year or less. So really most of our folks in our apartments have some form of rental assistance or an income-based kind of rent arrangement. So in other words, or to put that more specifically, uh, the average rent for an urban housing resident is about $525 a month. So, and especially in Nashville in 2023, uh, you know, we we really feel like it, that, that's what it takes to afford um, or to be able to, to uh, remain in an affordable home in, in a supportive community. And it really, to make that possible, we really need uh, public support ultimately to really uh, maintain rent that low. But again, the that's the affordable uh, home side of the equation. The supportive community uh, part of this essential combination is really where we can and we need the support of partner agencies and our own team of resident service coordinators to help connect our residents with other resources in the community. Uh, and we can just with a, with uh, careful uh, work together with our partners try to pick locations that are also well connected to transportation, community resources, uh, commercial and community space, so that we can have social and cultural programming to again, really enrich and build those social connections. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Brent. We're so glad that you're here and for the important work that Urban Housing Solutions does to support the development of affordable housing here in Nashville. Um, I'm going to, going to introduce our next panelist, um, Joe Mays, who uses he and him pronouns. Joe moved from, to Nashville from Redmond, Washington in December of 2013 and joined the Civic Design Center in the following March. Joe earned a bachelor's in arts of economics from York College of Pennsylvania and has enjoyed participating in the music department throughout his time in college. In Joe's intern career at the Design Center starting in 2014, he researched for Shaping the Healthy Community, the Nashville Plan publication, and helped create the Banker's Alley booklet. Joe currently serves as the project manager for the Civic Design Center, where he coordinates tactical urbanism projects, organizes community gatherings and public events, and guides design staff in the creation of visuals and graphics. Recently, Joe co-led the community engagement and visioning for Nashville's future LGBTQ plus community center, a project in partnership with and supported by Inclusion Tennessee. Um, Joe, thank you so much for being here. Um, if you just want to also provide us with a brief understanding of your work and how it connects to this conversation of LGBTQ plus elder housing, um, we're really glad that you're here with us today. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Thomas. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, this is a great panel. Um, I think Brent, you spoke a lot. You know, partners are very critical in um, all the all of this process. So, um, so our mission at the Civic Design Center is to create civic design visions and actual change uh, to improve the quality of life for all. So we believe that a built city um, that is planned and created. Um, by the people and with ideas from the community can be created in a good way. So um, Phil came to us to kind of help with this community engagement portion, um, as well to help create some baseline visions for what the community center could look like. So um, those were kind of our two tasks and how we're really involved in the, the planning of the future of the LGBTQ community center. Um, and so in that engagement, he mentioned that we had over a thousand people that were engaged in our process, um, and we really found that the physical spaces 
uh, the physical space that was identified in 2019 kind of rang true still, right? Like that was a very big need for the community. Um, kind of thinking about, you know, after COVID, is this still a critical piece um, that we need? So um, housing and healthcare were two major things and kind of building a sense of community and proper programming uh, for uh, the LGBTQ community. Um, so those were kind of the things that we found in, in the study. And we kind of took those um, ideas and led them into uh, a baseline vision. Um, and that's that vision is an advocacy tool to kind of lead into um, what a community center might look like in the future. So um, another interesting thing we found about um, in this process was there was people from Alabama to Kentucky that were engaged within this process and excited to have uh, this sort of center in the southeast. So um, it kind of talk speaks to the critical need of a physical space um, leading into the future uh, for everybody to connect. So uh, thank you for having me and yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> We're really appreciative of the work that you did with Inclusion Tennessee to support this community needs assessment. Um, for LGBTQ plus folks. Um, and we're really glad that you're here in this conversation today. Um, our final panelist today is Sally Hussey, who uses she, her pronouns. Sally, originally from Mississippi, has worked in the Nashville nonprofit sector for 25 years. She began her work at 50 Forward, known as Senior Citizens Inc. at the time, and then became the executive director for Casa of Nashville, helping grow the agency and relocate it to its current home in East Nashville. She became the CEO of Bridges Serving the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in 2008, leading this organization through a merger, relocation, and financial struggles, and helping the agency secure CNM's coveted Salute to Excellence Memorial Foundation Leadership Award of 2011. Prior to rejoining 50 Forward, Sally took a brief break from executive leadership and served as chief development officer at The Next Door, an addiction treatment center for women, to create the agency's fundraising program. She returned home to 50 Forward in October of 2018 as the agency's chief executive officer. Sally holds a bachelor's degree from Mississippi State University and a master's in public relations and advertising from the University of Alabama. She was named one of the Tennesseans top 40 under 40 business leaders, one of the Nashville Post's most influential people, and she is a member of Leadership Nashville, a member of the table and a Rotarian. Sally, we're so excited to welcome you to this conversation. Um, I, when I read this bio the first time, I didn't realize that you'd been to Mississippi State, but I was born in Starkville, so a <gasps> little connection there. <laughs> um, but if you just want to share with us as well a little bit about your work and how it connects to this conversation of supporting LGBTQ plus elders in housing, that would be great. I will do it. Thank you very much in the hell state, Thomas. Um, and let me give a, also a shout out back to you, Phil. Uh, thank you for teasing a little bit about the drag bingo party on June 23rd. We are really excited to be hosting that and uh, Phil will send out some more information. Everybody is invited. It's really going to be fun. So uh, 50 Forward's mission is to support, champion, and enhance life for all adults over the age of 50. And that means all adults. And we take the word support really, really seriously. And we at 50 Forward, I think Phil mentioned, you heard him talk about the Pride Survey back in 2019. 50 Forward was a part of that. And it really dawned on us then that we were not supporting the entire population over the age of 50 in meaningful ways. And so we have done some work uh, since then. Inclusion Tennessee, Phil has helped us do some of that work because supporting older adults, thank you for calling them older adults, Phil, um, it has really, it, it's taken a different trajectory, especially over the last couple of years. But we really undertook a, a formal process to understand the needs of the LGBTQ plus older adult community, especially here in Tennessee. And over the last couple of years have worked really hard to do some internal work here. Uh, 
went to have some discussions with the LGBTQ plus chamber, uh, the Vanderbilt program for LGBTQ health. And the goal is really to seek information about what we could do here at 50 Forward around language, around physical space, um, around skills and knowledge for our staff. Because while we are not uh, an organization that works specifically with housing, of course, we do have seven lifelong learning centers. That's what we call them. We don't call them senior centers. But the lifelong learning centers need to be spaces that are welcoming for all older adults. And so we've done some work to make sure that adults over the age of 50 who are in the LGBTQ plus community feel like they are a part of this organization. So we do see ourselves connecting into this conversation about housing because there's also a piece that, that we know in the older adult space that older adults feel more comfortable connecting with individuals who are friends if they need information about resources. And we, uh, older adults come to us to ask about how to get help, how to connect with the resources. And we feel there's a space for us around housing if we can connect them to those resources. So that's, we did that first beginning step of work um, a few years back and are continuing to learn and to grow because this does need to be a place that all older adults uh, feel a part of. And uh, we're excited to continue that work and be a part of the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Sally, for being here and being a part of this conversation um, and for all of the work that you are committed to at making 50 Forward an inclusive organization for LGBTQ plus older adults. Um, since we've already sort of done some brief introductions as a panel, we're going to dive right into our conversation today. Um, and earlier today from Phil and from Sydney, we heard about the housing crisis in the country for LGBTQ plus older adults. Um, and we also heard about some examples of LGBTQ plus affirming older adult housing that is affordable across the country. Um, so my first question is, do you think that this type of affirming older adult housing um, is possible for Nashville? And what would it take for us to get there? Um, not only from maybe a design or development perspective, but also from the services and the things that we would need to provide the community there. So I'll open the floor to our four panelists um, to talk about this type of housing. Well, I, I can I can start off. Um, it starts with funding. <laughs> it always starts with funding. Um, and my my year in affordable housing development has taught me that it's not just about an onion that you're peeling. It's putting the onion back together after it's peeled. Um, it's it's that difficult. And um, I think that uh, understanding that uh, a great idea that everybody loves that is um, fully financed is still 18 months from a shovel and another 18 months from someone moving in is a reality check. And so um, I think that uh, getting um, an understanding as to the length of time it takes to get new projects online is a first step in the education process with our community. Um, as I said, it's there's sort of this weird missing uh, middle in uh, that I know that 50 Forward is anxious to solve the puzzle of those of us who are still working well into our 70s, uh, being able to find places to to gather and to talk to each other uh, after after work hours, whatever that means, because work is work hours are so different, uh, particularly post COVID with more people working from home and even feeling more isolated because of that. So finding, finding this new reality in that regard, but also understanding that the housing that we're building now is for folks that will need it later, not for housing that people need it now. That started three years ago. And so um, it's kind of understanding how that, um, how that process turns. I'd, Love to hear uh, more uh, from Urban Housing Solutions about how they keep that pipeline going. Uh, well, 
Uh, certainly, uh, Nancy hit it right on the head that, um, you know, money makes the world go round or makes makes the projects come out of the ground. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we uh, I think, uh, hopefully, Nashville and, and really across the country, you know, can, we'll see some additional federal uh, dollars available in the next 12 to 24 months to help um, basically address climate resilience. But I think some of that money could potentially be leveraged for affordable housing. I think that's the intention, actually, for some of that money. And, uh, you know, hoping that uh, Nashville gets a good chunk of that money. And uh, we, Urban Housing, this community can put that together, uh, put, put, that, put some of that together and put it to good use for um, elder housing, older adult housing, uh, specifically uh, LGBTQ plus affirming uh, older adult housing. And, um, you know, and, and really try to, um, uh, you know, actually uh, uh, realize this vision, although to Nancy's point, that does take, unfortunately, two to three years, even from, you know, coming up with the, the right partners and uh, bringing it together formally, uh, there is still this kind of, you know, un unavoidable, um, you know, kind of lag time, if you will, from um, the final design to the actual, you know, construction or even the initial uh, idea, especially to the final, um, uh, you know, construction. But the, um, you know, one thing that we can obviously do in the meantime is to, is to begin to build the support locally for this idea, which is obviously one, one, uh, hopefully one outcome of this, uh, of this event, this round table. And um, also to really begin and as uh, inclusion and 50 forward are doing to begin to actually um, activate and uh, organize, you know, uh, the community a little more um, socially and politically and, um, you know, um, meaningfully so that we can really begin to uh, to um, identify the folks that would actually want to live in this community and uh, and the programming and the opportunities to really uh, animate that community when it's finished. Yeah, and I'll just add that I, I think it's that continued uh, advocacy. You know, you we learn about these projects; they're they're going to happen. Um, but you know, before they're happening, uh, just making sure that you're able to advocate for them to happen and making sure that your elected officials know that these things are something that you want. Um, it is a very top level thing that you can do, but it can go a long way just to know that um, it is a want and a need of the community. So advocacy and education about it and making sure people aren't uh, ill-informed about uh, what affordable housing uh, means in their community and how it can be treated as a community asset is a really important thing to consider um, when you're having conversations just with anybody in your neighborhood or at a bar or at a cafe, it doesn't really matter, you know, always uh, putting it into into a conversation so that um, kind of spreads the word um, can definitely help get some of those funding resources in the future um, and have some uh, program programmatic ideas for the future for those spaces. So let me wind this conversation, this question up with I love that last piece you said, Joe. Um, educate around what is affordable housing and, and Brent and Joe, y'all may be able to come in to a place like 50 Forward and have that piece of the conversation in a space like ours. Because sometimes I think you, those of us in, in this world use that, that language thinking everybody knows what affordable housing is. And mm -hmm. you know, not everybody does. And so uh, when we want to educate maybe the legislature or, or the council, it, it starts with a simple conversation here around, you know, gosh, let's have lunch and coffee and talk about how you, how we can go 50 forward and our folks can go up and have a great conversation with um, Nancy Van Reese. We don't have to do it with Nancy, but Nancy can take us to the rest of the council. But mm -hmm. Y'all can educate us about around the three or four or five things to say. That might be another a next great step, and we could do that here uh, across all our centers. That might be a, a wonderful thing to come out of this in a next step. We'd love to. Okay. Wonderful. 
thank you all for your input there. I'm, I'm hearing a lot about just the importance of continuing to talk about this need, not only to each other as community members, but also to electeds, to developers, to potential funders. Um, and I also just want to thank Nancy for reminding us that this project is an investment. Um, it's not something that we're going to see happen tomorrow, but it's something that we are investing in for our community and the community of older adults to come in Nashville. Um, and funding, as Nancy and Brent said, is a huge piece <laughs> of this process. Um, so thank you all again for your thoughts on, on how we can bring that type of affordable housing here to Nashville. Um, now, I want to make sure we have some time for a question and answer portion. Um, so I just want us want you each to spend, um, before we move into that question and answer from the audience, I'd love for you each to spend a couple minutes just um, sharing with us um, when you imagine an equitable landscape for LGBTQ plus older adults in Nashville, um, what do you see? And what could we do to get there um, to this beautiful, imaginative, equitable landscape? Um, and again, this is going to be short and sweet. Um, so we have some time for question and answers from the audience. Um, and I would love to hear from each of you. So why don't we start with... Um, Sally, do you mind starting starting for us? <laughs> I'm happy to. When I imagine a, a more equitable housing landscape for everyone, um, I see a housing that that involves or invites everyone from 50 plus. Nancy touched on this a little bit. Um, it is older adults who are 50 want and need housing and 55 or 60 need affirming housing that might look a little different than those who are 85 plus. So I imagine it to be inclusive of everyone and not just that physical housing, but has also social and gathering spaces um, and are close to, if not have resources right there with them, like a 50 forward. Wonderful. Thank you, Sally, for that love imagining uh, an inclusive place like 50 Forward being connected to housing for older adults in the community. Um, Joe, I'm going to toss it over to you now. Yeah, and uh, definitely want to say just on top of that, you know, the places to socialize is very important. Um, that seems to be what is missing the most um, and maybe just the underutilized places that we have in Nashville. So um, when we're talking about the um, affordable housing and the um, older adult housing that we need um, in the community, we can think about maybe how do we get there, who can get there, and um, what are the spaces that they also want to get to. So making sure that these places have uh, adequate access to transit, um, adequate access to other social needs and other demographics. So making sure that the youth is involved, um, and, you know, kind of understanding that, you know, throughout the generations, they're able to um, connect and socialize and kind of creating those spaces um, and understanding that um, and having those accesses to resources as well. So hopefully that's what this community center can provide is, um, you know, as, as we're getting older, we might need more access to um, some healthcare needs. So that, you know, making sure that those are considered when we're creating um, these elder, um, um, spaces and um, making sure that our built environment around it, so our roads and our and our parks and our community centers kind of um, go along with the housing and are used as a resource and making sure that people who are moving there know that those are there for them um, and that they are included in those community spaces um, and making sure they're inclusive um, through design and um, through promotion of, of the programs that are that are done in those spaces. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I'm I'm hearing again the emphasis on service provision, which we know is so important for older adult housing in general, but especially for LGBTQ plus older adults who already lack access to inclusive um, and affirming services. And also hearing the importance of the physical design space being made inclusive, which I, I feel like we don't talk about as often, but it is an, a really important piece. And maybe we'll get to dive into that a little bit more in our breakout sessions um, later today. Um, Brent, I'm gonna toss it over to you now. Sure, thanks Thomas. I was just gonna build on what Joe was saying that, um, you know, really to 
I think to ensure genuine inclusion that obviously, you know, we need to be intentional. And my vision is that we will be intentional about planning the space and the, um, the programming and the partners to come together to really have that um, responsive, you know, trauma informed design and um, supportive space, actual physically and, uh, you know, uh, spiritually supportive space. But but to, to, to center that really in, a, in an area and, a, and around or within, in other words, an area where um, there are all other uh, magnetic uh, resources and assets for the for the broader community so that that way everybody is equally benefiting. Uh, and really, we can try to use this investment to Nancy's point, use this investment in uh, affordable uh, housing for older adults. It's LGBTQ plus affirming with potentially on-site health care and some other, you know, uh, needed resources that the LGBTQ plus community needs, but also everyone would benefit from and could help really catalyze additional, um, you know, uh, resources and, and investment in our, in our, in our city uh, in a way that uh, really kind of it raises the tide, lifts the tide for everybody in a way that, uh, but most importantly, um, is directly accessible and truly inclusive of of our entire community where everyone everyone has a place and belongs here and we need to make sure that by intentionally planning and locating uh and um partnering that we can really realize that vision and also again um you know serve all of nashville in the end yeah thank you so much brent um i really want to emphasize the importance of trauma-informed design especially in the context of the legacies of harm and discrimination that lgbtq plus older adults have experienced throughout their lifetime and still experience today um, and just appreciate how urban housing solutions is um, thinking of and aware of how this potential building and space could impact the larger community as a whole um, and the physical space of the community as well um, Nancy, I'm going to toss it to you um, to finish us off before our question and answer today. Uh, I appreciate every everything that was just said. I, I um, was searching for something uh, to to say on top of that, and and I realized the images behind me and what that informs me of. Um, uh, to uh, my shoulder on this side is a painting by Omari Booker, a Nashville artist who also is at some of uh, Urban Housing Solutions locations. And that painting's headed to uh, the Briarville Apartments for us. And then over here, a couple of portraits of mine of uh, Del and Phyllis. And, um, and uh, as a tribute to um, their legacy um, in our culture and our history um, um, that uh, Phyllis Lyon and, and Del Martin had, I'd like to have places where these two kids and these two ladies could live together. And, and, and creating environments like that is ultimately uh, what I'd like to see happen in Nashville. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. And just, I appreciate the intentionality of how you build your physical space, even in your Zoom box um, and the mission that you move forward with and wanting to create a more inclusive community for all Nashvilleans. Um, but thank you again for um, all four of you just for contributing to this conversation and opening the floor for what the possibilities are for building this type of inclusive housing um, and inclusive community space in Nashville. So we're going to take some time here and do some question and answers from the audience for the four of y'all. And we actually already have a question in the chat um, from Ed. So very um, grateful, Ed, for, for submitting a question. So this question from Ed is, do banks get any Community Investment Act credit if they lend or fund for this type of project? And then the second question is, um, does the LGBTQ plus community earn points the same way that other marginalized communities might earn points, whether it be by race or income or other identity statuses? Um, so I will um, toss that question over to the four of y'all, whoever wants to dive in. I'll take the first stab. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there is no specific benefit to a bank, uh, no additional community investment tax credit, uh, which is a local, a state level program, by the way, in Tennessee, uh, that provides banks with a franchise and excise tax credit for making low interest loans for affordable housing. Uh, I don't think there's an additional benefit for, um, you know, certainly not in this state. 
uh, for supporting LGBTQ plus um, housing. But I think essentially to qualify for that program, as long as the apartments or, uh, you know, for sale home is affordable to folks uh, with incomes at or below 80% of median income, which is about $48,000, $50,000 a year, uh, then it would qualify for the CITC. So there's not additional points to my knowledge, and, and I really doubt, at least in the near term, that's going to be something our state legislature would uh, unfortunately support. But um, but I think that there is already a mechanism that's available kind of broadly that could be used very intentionally for this type of uh, community. That's right. And, and I think, you know, there's there's this pesky thing called fair housing. And so even as we uh, market and support inclusive uh, spaces, uh, we still have to be mindful of the fact that you can't necessarily turn people away either. And so uh, I know that um, uh, in, in seeing other places and uh, being with Phil on a couple of different uh, visits that we had, it's a, it's a matter of marketing. And I know that um, uh, Kelsey had mentioned in the chat too with uh, Urban Housing Solutions and the LDG is, is very um, mindful of making sure that as you market or whatever um, uh, um, organization you have managing the property where you're marketing the property, that there are signals, there are very, very true signals. Whenever I'm going on to a site to look at a floor plan, what am I seeing? What are those images? Are, are there um, uh, um, couples together that that signal to me that this is a safe place to be in my marketing. Um, and uh, there's also opportunities um, to, um, to talk to groups of uh, folks, uh, as uh, Sally has mentioned, to be able to kind of spread the word that, hey, if, if we go here, there may there's gonna be some programming involved and, and I feel safe because I know those people and those people will make me feel safe. and. I know that um, the Urban League is very much engaged in wanting to do work like that as well. And so I think that uh, marketing inclusive spaces and, and an intentional way uh, will, will help us um, quite a bit. Wonderful, thank you for your insight on that question, Brent and Nancy, and thank you again, Ed, for asking. Um, we have about three more minutes of Q&A time. Um, so I'm gonna hit this question from Kelsey. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, this question is, while we plan for new um, sort of purpose-driven housing and community space in Nashville, are there things that we can do to encourage or advocate for our existing housing stock to become more affirming and supportive of LGBTQ plus people and older adults? Um, so I will toss that question over to our panelists. Yeah, so I, I think just to start off, I think continuing what Nancy said, the marketing side of it and making sure that those spaces that are being created are um, being inclusive of the LGBT community is very important. Um, and then intentionally building places that are near um, community resources such as public transit and you have access to those. So advocating for public transit um, and some of these affordable spaces, you know, making sure transit oriented development um, is something you can advocate for to, to be intentional about where the space is going to be. Um, our pikes have really great transit access. And so that's probably, you know, what makes the most sense. So if you see a development going up and um, can advocate for saying, hey, I really like this design. Um, is there any chance that we can have affordable housing in this development? Um, you know, it's very difficult to do any required affordable housing in Tennessee, but um, that if you keep that conversation on the forefront and it's in the back of the head um, of whoever might be developing those sites along the corridor, that is something you can always keep pitching and hoping that it comes true, um, as well as advocating at the state level uh, for some of those changes to, to be made, so. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that and those notes on how we can get involved in advocacy. Um, any other notes from our panelists on this question of how the existing housing stock can be made more LGBTQ plus affirming for older adults? I, I'd go back to the signaling again. I think that if I'm uh, if I'm looking for housing, I'm just look I'm just looking for the first one that says yes 
uh, honestly. It's it, you know, the the waiting lists are so long, and I'm just, I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing my part to fill out all those forms and to try to get this location. Um, but having a, a sense of, of peace in regard to, to those things, if I'm going in to a property manager's office and I see a, a TEP sticker on the window, or if I see a rainbow flag on a desk, or if I, any kind of signaling that tells me that, okay, I can exhale some of the self-checking, some of this, this self monitoring that is going on inside my head while I'm filling out these forms because I'm not sure whether or not they're going to be okay with my wife and I being here. I, getting rid of some of that internal trauma by simple signaling, I think could go a very long way. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, for that. Um, and that is unfortunately all the time we have for Q&A from the audience. Um, but we can um, hopefully discuss more of the questions you have in our wonderful breakout sessions today. Um, and before we introduce um, the break, I did just wanna share, I'm sharing in the chat, the website to SAGE's National LGBTQ Plus Elder Housing Initiative, because if you are a current housing developer or property manager or work in affordable housing, we provide many resources to help you um, create a more inclusive environment for LGBTQ plus older adults. So I highly recommend diving into some of the resources that we provide. But thank you again, panelists, um, for your time and energy um, and expertise in this space. We're so, so incredibly grateful um, for what you shared and for your commitment to LGBTQ plus equality in your work. Um, so thank you. Welcome back to the main session. Um, I hope you all had lovely conversations in your breakout. I know we were having a great conversation over in the financing group. Um, we got cut off there by the end of the breakout session. So I'm sorry, Mick, um, that you didn't get to finish your sentence there. But um, we are going to just spend a little bit of time hearing about some of the key takeaways from your breakout sessions. Um, and so if you are a breakout session facilitator, if you could um, come on camera just so we can hear from your session. And actually, Phil, who spoke to us earlier, is going to facilitate this um, conversation about our key takeaways. So I'm going to hand it over to Phil um, and our wonderful breakout session facilitators as well. Thanks, Phil. All right. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> um, so I think we'll start with, uh, let's start with the finance. Uh, financing group. Great. Well, that is um, actually Mick and I's group. Um, so I'll hop back on for just a second. Um, we had a lovely conversation in the financing um, breakout session, specifically exploring um, sort of what would it take for us to be able to finance this type of project, this inclusive housing type of project here in the state. When we talked a lot about um, the challenges that would come up in terms of applying for and potentially securing state funding, um, challenges with the state legislature being not affirming to LGBTQ plus folks. Um, and we explored some different ways to potentially navigate that, um, whether it's flying under the radar, but not too far under the radar that people don't know that it's affirming, sort of like finding this balance um, to apply for for state funding and to secure state support for this type of project. Um, and we also talked about some different potential opportunities for addressing gap funding issues as it will definitely come up in this type of project. Um, and then we finished off our conversation just discussing a little bit about um, fair housing regulations and specifically um, the new, I, mean, I say new, it was 2020, the Bostock v. Clayton Stop ruling right. Um, protecting um, LGBTQ plus people from housing discrimination by including sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes. Um, so it was a really interesting conversation. Um, and I don't know if anyone from our group, I believe we had Mick, Brent, and Rashida, and Daryl, if they're still on the call, if anyone wants to hop in and say a few things, if I miss something, go for it. But it was wonderful. Great. Got a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> cool. 
I, I, I don't want to speak for Rashida, but Rashida did mention that uh, the Barnes Affordable Housing Trust Fund, our local um, affordable housing <laughs> trust fund, uh, will have a, another round of funding in the fall that will be targeted, I think, toward older adults. And uh, you know, Rashida encouraged uh, anyone to apply for, obviously, to, for that particular kind of group of folks, but also, you know, to um, to that this kind of concept of LGBTQ plus affirming housing for older adults would be, uh, you know, a welcome and competitive uh, concept. So just wanted to put that word out there. Good to know. Good to know. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, let's move over to um, services and operations. I was a part of that group. Um, and uh, I'm looking for Olivia on my screen. Olivia led that conversation. Um, Olivia, you want to jump in and talk a little bit about what we discussed? And Olivia messaged me and said that she is having tech difficulties and may not be able to unmute. Okay. Um, glad I took some notes. <laughs> um, Chris, I'm also going to lean in on you as well, um, since you were part of that group as well. But um, we talked about a, a lot of different topics. And I also I'm going to bring in, uh, let's see, where Paula, hi. Paula with Agewell, Middle Tennessee, and Lauren um, Berner. Davis, since we are having some tech difficulties, I'm going to bring in my our, our group participants, which it was a really rousing conversation around um, around uh, services and operation. And I think some of the things that stood out to to me in the in the conversation as I was listening along um, was this idea around uh, creating ongoing educational opportunities uh, between uh, young adults and the older adult population, um, creating communities of care um, to ensure that uh, there is sort of this ongoing idea of care in any space that is created, um, and that we are uh, always focused, and I love this terminology, and I think Lauren said this in the chat, uh, was this healing-centered healing -centered conflict. Um, and Olivia, I think you're off mute now. I am. Yeah. Healing centered conflict hey. resolution. I wrote that down yes. too. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, and this idea of um, how do we really create operationally a sense of safety for everyone? Um, because it is one thing to uh, create a built environment um, that is sort of physically safe or, um, you know, signals aesthetically that it's a welcoming space, but um, managing how people actually show up is a, an ongoing conversation that requires us to constantly be meeting people where they're at and recognizing a lot of the intersectionality of, um, of these issues of, of folks' different identities that they show up with. Um, and so having a, a sense of Conflict resolution that is healing centered. That's about um, you know getting to the next best place that we can all be in, knowing that it probably won't ever quite be perfect. Um, and uh, part of that being something that was highlighted of really um, making sure that the mission, the values of the space. Um, and of the programming are really present in the leasing process as well, that when people enter the space as a resident, they know what they're getting into and um, the ways in which they will be held accountable to the, the mission and values. Um, because uh, as I believe it was um, uh, Reverend Don said this, who uh, had to pop off, uh, but the threat is real. Um, the threat is real, especially uh, for a lot of older adults who have had a whole lifetime to rack up any number of traumatic experiences, you know, right. um, knowing that that we're coming from those places as well and that trauma informed care um, in many aspects, many facets of trauma informed care is really crucial and recognizing that trauma informed care may look different for older adults than it would for younger adults. Absolutely. 
think, you know, one other thing I want to pull through, and I think, Nancy, you talked about this in the very beginning of, of our conversations today around wanting to see vis visible signs that I am welcome here. And Chris brought that up in, in our breakout group as well. And I thought that that was really interesting about how just being able to see that I am welcome in this space is really critical. So that's signs of, and not only in the marketing, but it's a sign, it could be a sign on the door, but it also is really critical for, for signs in the management structure of the facility, right? So that we knowing that when I walk into a space or when we walk into a space at the manager management of the facility and the staff that works there is also fully welcoming uh, and embraces who I am as as a, a, a fully functioning member of the LGBT community, fully uh, embraced member of society, right? right? And so like that is that is really critical, um, I think as well to to this greater picture. So do we want to add? I, I think, yeah, I, I think that fifty forward has seen that simple uh, action really. Uh, do wonders uh, for them uh, right. it just it, on their doors and as they welcome uh, people and and uh, if uh, and this is a challenge for me too because I know I know that um, uh, LDG uses a, a management uh, uh, company at our Tennessee locations is different in other locations we have a, a new company called Solidago that's doing a lot of our um, management of locations in, in the state of Texas. And I know that um, UHS uh, uses uh, Freeman quite a bit. I don't know, I don't know who who's asking those questions or whether or not we can be kind of informing those management companies uh, that if they need uh, uh, bias training or think whatever they need that we begin to proactively provide that. Yeah, great point, great point. Um, anything else from services and operations before we jump over to design and development? Okay, design and development, you're up. All right, um, we had an awesome discussion. Um, thank you to Joe and Casey, Mary Ellen, Ed, Phil, Lynn, Nancy, Derek, and Amanda. Um, we started out talking about the importance of engaging the community to inform any design decisions that are made. Um, so that can be everything from surveying um, to some of the research work that Ascendant has been doing uh, to inform their projects. Um, and so just grounding the decision-making process in the experience of the folks who are gonna live there. Um, we talked a lot about the power of the common areas and the amenities um, and specifically the entry sequence to both kind of, I think, set a tone for what that space is for, who it's for, um, and to, to foster those like informal interactions and connections among neighbors. Um, so how do you arrange the amenities? How do you set up that entry sequence to acknowledge the importance of security and safety, um, but also promote interactions and those kind of um, like col casual collisions between people? Um, we talked a lot about the power of art, um, both from uh, from just a, a kind of beauty, um, both um, visual art, um, the connection to the outdoors, um, but also from a, a creating art and um, the importance of self-expression and having places for people to not only be who they are, but also show who they are. Um, and then I talked a lot about kind of the, the specifics about housing specifically for older adults. Um, and so universal design, the importance of acoustics and lighting and and really just the intention that goes into making spaces that are um, really responsive to those needs. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the opportunities for intergenerational communities, um, both in the housing itself and in um, specifically those common areas and how do you leverage those spaces, um, interior and outdoors, um, formal and informal, programmed and casual um, to set up places where folks can gather in whatever way is is most comfortable and, um, and affirming to them. So I think that Covered it. There were a lot of really great examples of resources and projects um, that we grabbed from the chat. So thanks to everyone for contributing those. 
Amazing. Thank you, Kelsey. All right. Thank you. Thomas, back to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Phil. Um, and thank you, everyone. We are um, just a minute over our time here. Um, so I'm just going to quickly close this out by saying thank you so much for being here um, and for being a part of this conversation. The energy in this Zoom room is felt. Um, it is positive. It is affirming. Um, it is passionate for this type of beautiful, affirming, affordable housing um, to care for the older adults in our community. Um, if you'd like to continue to engage with Sage, um, I'm going to post my email in the chat. Um, so feel free to shoot me an email. Oh, thank you, KT, for doing that. Um, and additionally, we will be sending out a um, survey about this event, a short survey. Please give us your feedback about this event. Um, we host these type of regional events at Sage um, twice a year, and so it's very helpful to get feedback on how this event um, went from the participant um, perspective. But thank you again, and thank you to all of our panelists and for Tuttle Co for all of your amazing work and support um, in this event, and have a lovely rest of your Tuesday. <laughs>